You got this solo? Yes. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come before you one more time and teach your word. Father, I pray, God, that you'll anoint me, God, and anoint the words, God. That, Father, that they enter our hearts, God, and that they destroy the yokes in our hearts, God. And, Father, that they will grow us into a greater relationship with you tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're still teaching on grace, and tonight is walking in grace. And uh, first of all, I just want to say, I am so glad to be back. Yeah. Amen. I missed y'all. And, uh, and I know that, that all of my family was glad for me to go because I had no one to preach to except them. And I was hemmed up in the house with them for several days. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I am glad to be back. And I did miss y'all. Amen. We're going to James 4 and 6, and we're going to be teaching out of there tonight. And this is walking in grace. You know, we, we started studying about uh, uh, what grace is, the power of grace, the justification of grace, the sanctification, uh, sanctification of grace, the cleansing of grace, and now we're walking in grace. Amen? Amen. James 4 and 6. But He giveth more grace... Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Go ahead and be reseated tonight. You know, and, uh, as I was digging into this and continuing to study and dig deeper into grace, you know, it doesn't do us any good to know that the power of grace and the justification of grace and the sanctification of grace if we cannot walk in it. Amen? You know, that's what we should be doing. That should be all of our goals tonight is to be able to walk in grace every single day, walking in grace. And so, you know, the first things that I wanted us to look at is the word more. Because when we see the word more, it says, but he giveth more grace. Now, I don't know. I mean, I come from Hillbilly Hill University. And I'm thinking, but giveth he more grace is not really good English. So, so I, I was thinking, you know, that if it's not good English, then what was in the Greek, what is it trying to say? What was James trying to say that that's the only way that we could say that in the English? And so I looked up the word there more, and it's my zone. My zone. And uh, M E I Z O N. My zone. And what it means is more than. It means greater than. It means older than. It means larger than. Whatever that it is compared to. It means it has a greater weight or value. So if this, in studying it out, and what one of the examples that, that the dictionary said that it give, there was, uh, if you was in a room full of people, what the word there, maison, would reflect is it would be pointing directly to the oldest person. So if you were using that word and you were talking about a congregation and you had that word in there, it would be pointed towards the oldest person in the room, the person with the greater age in there. If you were talking and you had a plate or a dish that had something mounted up on it, it would be pointing towards the direction of the plate that had the most or the larger portion on it. And if it was talking about a glass that were full and you had several glasses up there, it would be talking about the glass that was the most full with the largest portion. So when we look at this word, my zone, in this language here, what is it pointing towards? Help me out. Don't leave me hanging. More, More what? The most. The most the what? Righteous the righteous portion of what? Grace. Grace. Thank you. Because <laughs> uh, it said, He giveth more grace. 
That means He gives us the largest portion, the biggest portion, the, the greatest of all that we need of grace. Now, how many of us can remember grace is kateris in the Greek and, and it means what? That it can afford without loss of joy, pleasure, kindness. It, it, it gives the idea uh, of, and the more of delight, uh, charm, sweetness, loveliness, favor, strength, faith, knowledge, and power. So, what this word is pointing, pointing towards there, my zone, is kateris, the measure of greatness of whatever we need. If it's joy in our life, if it's power in our life, if it's strength in our life, if it's love in our life, it's pointing towards that, meaning that whatever challenges that we face, it gives us the ability to be able to have a greater portion than whatever the devil is dishing out. The Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Meaning that whatever you are challenged with today, the word kateris there is being able to pour out and overcome it in your life. And the reason that it is there and God gives that ability to give you that kateris, that, that my zone to be able to overcome that in your life is because you need the ability to walk in it. Now here are some of the things that I have been guilty of in my life and I have also noticed in others. So I'm not, just as I'm pointing a finger and maybe going to step on a few toes, I'm pointing it back at myself. But some of the things and problems that I have had in my life is it's not that hard to get under grace and get a blessing when you need it. But it's much harder to walk in it. Because what we do is when we're in a time of need and we're in trouble and we're needing something from God right then, we will pour ourselves out and we'll fall down before a humble God and we'll say, God, fix my problem for me. Whatever you need to do in my life, you fix it. God fixes it. Grace is released in your life because you humbled yourself and then as soon as it's fixed, you get up and now that you've got your grace, you walk out of it. And what does that mean? Is we go do our own thing again. I tell you that if you want to change the economy in this world, worldwide economy change, if we would just learn to walk in grace. Because every time that somebody walks out of grace, the church houses get fewer and fewer. Amen? Every time somebody walks out of grace, the church numbers get fewer and fewer. If people would return back to grace or continue to walk in grace, we would have a stimulus package that there would not be enough workers building churches across this world to hold everybody if they would just learn to continually walk in grace. But the problem that we have is we get the amount of grace that we need in our life and then as soon as we have it, as soon as our problem is fixed, right out the door we go. So we need to write Obama a letter or whoever is going to be the next president that if we need a new stimulus package, let's just learn to walk in grace and that will fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a stimulus package. There will not be enough workers. There will not be enough materials to build with in this world. And so therefore our resources and everything that is around it would be consumed and the economy would boom. There would be nobody unemployed if we would just learn to what? Walk in grace. But the reality is, is there is a lot of people that does not walk in grace. And so the more that I have prayed, is like, God, then why? Why are we not walking in grace? If I could have your eternal blessing in my life, just showering down on me all the time, the perisas, the abandoned life, remember that word, perisas? I love that word, perisas. I mean, it just almost sounds like something you want to eat, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe that's why I like it. <laughs> but anyway, it, it means, you know, the parody sauce life. If I could just walk in that all the time, then why don't I? Why don't I? Why doesn't everybody walk in that kind of life? That freedom, that victory, that power, that anointing. Why don't we walk in it? It's because that we've not learned how. We've not learned how. We have learned how to get in grace when we're in a time of need. But we've not yet stayed there long enough to let the Holy Ghost train us and guide us to keep us there. To where that when we need something in our life, that it's there accessible all the time. Now, can it be done? Absolutely, it could be done. There's a lot of great men and women that has learned how to walk in that paradisos, in that kreos, in that grace. I mean, Smith Wiggleworth is a good example. He learned how to walk in that grace. I mean, he come out of, of a lifestyle that was less than and then learned how to walk in a lifestyle that was more than. And how did he learn to do that? Was through grace. He let the very thing that powered him teach him. And now I don't know, but if we was going to use great men and women of God, and we're talking about Smith Wigglesworth, I mean, he raised 26 or 27 people from the dead. I don't know about you, but I'm about 26 or 27 shy of his count right now. <laughs> Because we got work to do in our life. We got work to do and we should not be letting up or laxing up anywhere in our life uh, in our walk of Christ. We should not give no place to the devil. You know, and, and, and that is one of our biggest troubles is we give place to the devil. The Word of God says, neither give place to the devil. And that word place there is topos, and that's where we get our, our English word topo, meaning topo map. And so, so we, we see that, that we shouldn't give, and topo maps is an area of a specific area. So we shouldn't be giving the devil no specific area in our life. And we have not yet learned how to shut some doors in our life. And once that we shut doors in our life, then it will give us the opportunity to listen to the Spirit of God speak to us. You know, I've said this many times, and I, and I spoke of it again the other day, but when it comes to God speaking to us, we have to get ourselves into a position to where we can hear Him. And where I, you know, where God gave me a deep revelation of this was when I was in a space in my life, in a place in my life, and I needed, I needed an answer from God, but yet I was wrestling with the devil in my mind on, on all these ways that I needed to fix it or be able to fix it. When I finally found peace in my life and I come to a place that I didn't care what the answer was, I was going to have that peace in my life, God was able to clearly speak to me and I could hear Him. When I went back and I asked God, later. God, why didn't you speak to me earlier and tell me the answer if you knew that? And he said, I could not speak to you when you were in confusion. I am not the author of confusion. You have to get your place to, you have to get yourself to a place of peace to where when I speak to you, you know that I'm speaking to you. Boy, I tell you, that changed my life. I'm telling you. I mean, if I ever want something and I need something from God, the first thing I start to do is working on my mind, clearing up my thought, grabbing my thoughts, and bringing them under captivity. So that way, I can find peace within my spirit so I can hear from God. So anyway, that was free. But anyway, in order for us to walk in grace day by day, we got to come under some conditions. We have to be able to get into some conditions. We have to come under some conditions. There's some things that we need to work on in our life. See, because salvation is free. But grace, we have to learn and work to achieve it. And so, in our scripture that we started out with, our, our foundation, what do you think, real quick, somebody look at it, what do you think the area 
or the key or the condition is that we need to work on our life to be able to walk in grace. Okay, I'll help you out. It says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So, it's pride. Absolutely. And so I thought about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I thought about that today as I was putting this together. And it's like pride. You know, out of everything that God could have choose, He chose pride. Why did He chose pride to keep us where we don't, be, or, or don't have the ability to walk in grace? Why is pride the number one thing that He said, Hey, if you have pride in your life, you're not going to be able to walk in grace. Why? Because pride, in its very definition, which I thought was re unique, it is ara lea zonania. And it is one who is self-confident, self-trusting. It is one that is self-assured. So it is one that trusts in his own power and ability and resources. Mm. So maybe that's why God picked that word. <laughs> maybe that's why God picked that word for us not to be able to walk in grace. Is because if we are walking in pride, we are walking in our own self-assurance, our own trusting, our own abilities, and we have our own self-confidence. And so when I was looking at this, you know, there is so often that we get in trouble... And when we get in trouble, we get to a point that we can't get ourselves out of it. It's because pride is in our life. And God is not moving in the situation because God cannot move in a situation where there is confusion. So we have to back off, humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, change our will for His will for grace to be able to work in our life. Until that we submit underneath the mighty hand of God, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't moving nowhere because other than that, it is our own will, our own pride, our own self-control, our own trust in ourselves and confidence that is driving the bus. Yes. Not God. We can come to church, we can lay our hands, we can clap, we can say hallelujah all that we want. But if we are in control and God ain't in control, then we are living in pride. And then we can say, this ain't working for me. I'm having troubles. I'm struggling. I don't know why I can't get over this. I can't get past this. I don't know why that every time I turn around, there's trouble in my life. I don't know why that, that I struggle so much with all of these issues. Well, maybe you're still in control. Maybe you're still self-assured thinking you can do this. Maybe... You are trusting in your abilities instead of God's. You know, and the more that I looked at this, because I thought, you know, when I first started reading this, it said, God resisteth the proud. And I thought, man. Because when I looked up the word resist, mm, anatiatasos in the Greek, to range in a battle against Mm. God said that if we walk in pride, He's going to range in a battle against us. And then I thought, boy, that's pretty harsh. <laughs> Let me see if there's another definition for this word. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, how many is with me? Let's say, let please be a second entry in the dictionary. <laughs> okay. I, I hate to tell you, it don't get any better. Work against someone or something or oppose against them. So I thought, boy, God, this is, this is hard. God's going to work against us? He's going to war against us? And the more as I just sat there in my chair, because I had to take a moment to take this in. Because I thought, man, this ain't going to preach very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there and I'm taking this in. And then I started to realize that that is God's grace working in our life. When we step out of grace 
and God starts warring against us, then that is His grace. Because when he is warring against us, it's because we are living in pride and we're still in control. And God, all he wants for us is to serve him and say, God, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I give you all the authority in my life. You are my King. You are my Lordship in my life. Whatever your will is, I bow to it. I humble myself to your will and to your control. And sometimes God has to war in our life, putting us into a position to break us to where we have nowhere else to go other than up to Him. Yes. That's God's love. If God didn't love you, He'd leave you in your sin sicking condition right where you are, headed straight to hell. But God loves you so much that He will war against you everywhere that you turn and tell that you are broken and you reach up for Him. Amen. He will oppose you on every corner. So if you are struggling in areas in your life, Everywhere that you turn, it seems like there's another hardship. Maybe there's a financial burden. Maybe there's a spiritual bondage. Maybe there's something in your life that just seems like you can't get over in your life. Then maybe you need to just drop to your knees and reach up and say, God, I quit resisting you. I quit resisting you. I ain't going to fight you no more. I'm going to turn my will over to your will. Whatever that it be, God, I am yours. And then stay in that grace. Stay in that grace. Whatever it took for you to get there, then stay there. And the only way that we get there is by humbling ourselves. Humbling ourselves. You know, when we humble ourselves, it is tapapadanas, and it means to be made low. And again, when we're looking at this word and how it was written in the Greek, in the original language, and how it was used, was it give the idea of something that had the strength or ability to stand but chose not to. See, I have the strength and ability to live my own life any way that I want to. I have the strength and ability that if I wanted to, I could lay everything down and walk out that door and never preach another word. I have that ability. I have that strength within me to do that. But I choose not to because I humble myself before God. Amen. Knowing that it's not my will in my life, but it's His will that will be done. And so therefore, that is how that we walk in grace. Not doing what we want to do. Not You know, I give the testimony last night in our recovery group about in my life where God, you know, where, where the enemy put fear in my life on preaching. And then, you know, and it was just one Sunday morning. I knew what I was going to preach on Wednesday. And as, I got, as that day got closer to Wednesday, the more sick that I got and the more fear that come over me. And I had to get myself to a position. Now, you got to understand, it was in this building. That was 20-something years I've been preaching. And here it was when I got up here and we was doing praise and worship and we were singing. I was back there literally shaking and trembling inside. When I got up behind that pulpit, I was still shaking inside and I, when I started to pray my voice was cracking but I said God I thank you for the opportunity because I made up in my mind because the devil was sitting there telling me oh well you're sick to your stomach you can call somebody else to preach for you there's somebody else that will fill in you can do this or you can do that and I made up my mind that no matter what was going to happen in my life I was going to do it afraid I was not going to let the devil put a hook in me and have hook of fear in my life. I was going to do it afraid if I have to. Yeah. 
And I made up my mind that I would preach every message from here on out the rest of my life if I was terrified or not. I was not going to let the devil have one ounce of place in my life. And as soon as I got up and I started to pray, I literally, from the head to my feet, felt it wash over me and wash out the door. I know that was the spirit of fear that was trying to come over me. And when I stood up and I said, God, I'm going to walk in your grace. I don't care what the enemy is going to do in my life. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. No matter what, I'm going to be here for you just as you have called me to. Then his flowing grace washed over me, washing the spirit of fear off of me and out of here. We have to make up our mind that we're going to either serve God or we're going to play around. You know, there is no riding the fence. Either hot or you're cold. Either you're, either you're playing church or you're on fire for the church. It's one of the two. There is no in-between. We would like to think and we would like to try to figure out a way that there is an in-between. You know, the longer I stay in city government, the more I try, the more that I see that how everybody likes the gray area. <laughs> and you pay attorneys and everybody's for these opinions on how to make that gray area wider. <laughs> I, that's why the president has the attorney general. That's why our governor has the attorney general. That's why everybody's got an attorney to help them make the gray areas wider. Well, we have learned from that. And we've taken that same mentality and brought it into our Christian walk, thinking that, well, it's not black or white. There has to be a gray line there somewhere. Now, sitting in church, we say no. But when we walk out, the way we live our life shows that we may find, try to be looking for some gray area. But when we choose to just walk in grace, giving up our will, our cares for His will and His cares, then there is no gray area. It does become black or white. I'm just going to be honest. There is things in my life in the last 10 years I have just cut out and it, just, it despises me now. I'm sickened by the thought. But I was okay with it 10 years ago. Is there anybody here that would say, hey, I'm on that boat? There's things that a year ago that disgusted me that didn't bother me a year ago. You know, that's growing in grace. We are walking in grace when we have areas in our life that start to disgust us, but that didn't used to bother us. But then we'll find other areas that is acceptable in our life and we'll let them be. And so that's the areas that we find pride in. Romans 5 and 2, it says, By whom also we have access by faith unto grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Well, prasaaga go gay is to move into. That is what that word access. So, to whom we move into by faith. To whom that we move into by faith. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. If this is the line right here. If this is the line that is drawn and grace is there, I have to move into it by faith. I have to make a conscious decision to move into it. So often we want grace in our life, but we don't want to move. We don't want to change. We don't want to do anything. But once we move into it, this goes back to the teaching that we got to stay there. The word stand is estanamai. Estanamai. And it means to abide in, stay in one place. And it also means to be positioned or stick with it. So the word stand there means to stick with it in faith. If it ain't working today, don't try something different tomorrow. Stick with it. 
stick with it until God moves in your life. When you step into faith and you step into grace, you stay there no matter what it looks like, no matter what kind of hell is being poured upon you. You stand. You stay with it. You stick with it until the mighty hand of God moves the mountain in your life. So often, we give in and we don't stick with it. And what I really like here, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Now, I want to tell you, one of my other favorite words is glory. When we see that word glory in the Greek, it is doxa. And the word doxa, because when I first got a revelation of this, and I first got my first Greek dictionary, and I looked this up, and I looked up the word doxa, I was shocked. It wasn't what I expected. And then so I knew that if I was shocked, how many other people would be shocked of what that word meant? <laughs> See, because I always thought and I always assumed and I pictured the word glory of being a light, shining, brightness, splendor, awe. How many was with me? Well, there is two more primary definitions of how that word was used in the Greek, in its language, and in the New Testament. Now, it was in a couple of places, but when it was used to mean a light, it actually specifies that it was a light that was shining. Everywhere else, it is the definition that I'm fixing to give you. It means his good view, opinion, or judgment upon you. Always. I don't care if you use the Greek Theros lexicon or if you use the Strom's Concordance. I don't care if you what, I don't care what Greek dictionary that you go to to look this definition up, you will find that it means judgment, view, or opinion. Always in the New, in the New Testament, interpreted and translated as in God's good opinion of us. That gave me cold chills. <laughs> God's good opinion view and judgment of us. We war against ourselves so many times believing that, that God has a bad opinion of us and therefore we have to do more works in our life. And right here it says that when we access, when we move into, by faith, into grace, God's good opinion will be shown or poured about on us. When we step into grace, by faith, doxa is poured out on our life. So we just got to be able to stay there, stand. Stand in that position. Stay put in that position until we have a revelation of God's good opinion or judgment or view of us. And not choosing to cut and run. We have to choose to stay there. John, we're getting close to the end. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And I am the vine and you are the branch. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And we go back to that word abide. Now we look at that word abide right there in the Greek language. And it is meno. Boy, that almost makes me want to go fishing. Meno. To remain or stay put. Or to also remain with, it also means to sojourn with. To sojourn with. So when Jesus was saying, if you abide in me and I in you, what he was saying, if you sojourn with me, I will sojourn with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever that I go, you will go. We will become one. I think Jesus even said, 
Me and the Father are one. He said, I and the Father are one. And I am in you. So therefore, we are one with the Father. So if we abide in Jesus and Jesus abides in us, we so journey with Him, we are what now walking in grace. And if we abide with Him and we are walking in grace, He promises us one thing. What was that that He said? That if you abide in me and I abide in you, what can we do? He said that we would bear fruit. We will bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit. Ooh, there's that word more, the greater amount, the greater portion of fruit in our life. Now I thought, you know, why is the word fruit, what does it mean there? It means provision. It could be provision to the kingdom of God. It can be provision in our life. It can mean provision of deliverance. It can mean provision of healing. It can mean provision of finances. Whatever that we need, if we abide in Jesus Christ, His grace will work in our life to bring forth fruit and blessings in our life. What kind of testimony is it if we walk around broken and oppressed and depressed? Now, I'm not going to kick too many stones, but I, I have known some people. And Jana, she worked with some people. And, and they were professing Christians that they was raised in church and that they had gone to church their whole lives. I mean, you ask them, they would, they, they would just, I mean, they would, they would just, they would draw the line. I'm a Christian. But when you seen them, they walked around with their shoulders dropped forward and their head down. They worked like that. They acted like that at work, at home, at Walmarts, everywhere they went. They were grumpy. They were cantankerous. They were grouchy. It's like they never had a good day, but they would sit and talk about the love of Jesus all day long. How many of us has ever seen anybody like that? How many, how many of us want that kind of Jesus? I don't want that kind of Jesus in my life. I want a Jesus that gives me the petty sauce. <laughs> I want the Jesus that gives me more than in my life. If I need healing, that He gives me more than I need. If I need deliverance in an area that He is gracious enough to pour out His grace and give me more than in, in that area. Whatever I need in my area, that's the kind of Jesus I want. I want one that gives me joy and gives me joy abundantly in my life. I want to, no matter what I face, I have peace. That's the kind of Jesus I want to serve. And if I abide in Him, that is the fruit I'll have. A lot of it. The greater portion of it. You know, a branch, when it is grafted into the tree, the longer that it stays attached to the tree, the more that it becomes like the tree. The more it takes on its character of the tree. It is still bear its own fruit, but it will take on the characteristics of that tree. So the longer we stay hooked to Jesus Christ, learning how to walk with Him, the more that grace will teach us how to be like Him. You know, I am a firm believer that, that you know, I believe that it's important to have doctrine. And to have rules and guidelines. It helps, keeps us. You know, Paul said that, that, that the law, he said that we don't do away with it. He said, God forbid. Because the law teaches us that when we step out of line that that was wrong. We know that fire is hot because we have touched it and it burns us. We know that. That's what it's there for. But, on the other hand, grace, the things that we don't know, the things that we don't understand. If we stay with Jesus Christ, grace will teach us how to be more like Him. There is no doctrine, there is no rules, there is no bylaws or ordinances that we can pass or create or, or, or dictate in a church that will do more work than what grace can do. Because grace will guide us into righteousness every single time. Man will just drive us into doctrine of what they think is righteousness looks like. So anyway, we're getting ready to close. 
Colossians 6, or Colossians 1 and 6, and this is the thought that we're ending this with on this week. And then we'll pick up on grace again next week. Which is come unto me, or which is come unto you, as it is in all of the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doeth also in you. Since the day that you have heard of it, and you knew the grace of God in truth. Now when we think about that, since the day that you have heard it, that word right there, new, is epigene gnosko. And it means to become thoroughly acquainted with. The day that we come thoroughly acquainted with grace. The day that we come so acquainted with it that we know it so intimately and it's truth in our life. Then it will start to bring out fruit in our life. As we close, you will only become to know the full grace of God when you choose to humble yourself and abide in Him. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Father, as we come before You, Lord, I thank You and I praise You, God, for the words and the teaching of Your grace tonight. God, I thank You, Lord, as You draw us into this teaching, God, that You're teaching us how to live and walk underneath Your grace. <clears throat> Father, I pray that You'll work this Word deep into our hearts. God, that it will come back to our remembrance in a time of need when the enemy is warning against us. God, I pray, Lord, that You help us humble ourselves tonight and give our will to Yours in Jesus' name. Tonight, with every head bowed and everyone praying, I want to ask the question, are you struggling in your life? Do you know Jesus? Do you know that grace intimately? Are you struggling? Does it seem like there's a war going on and everywhere that you turn, everything is against you in your life? Maybe you need to humble yourself tonight. If that is you, just want you to come to the altar tonight. And let us pray. Let us war against the enemy and help you enter into God's grace. Let's just open up the altars tonight and let's all just find a place of prayer just for a few minutes.